Salutations to the Buddha. Namu Tas Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sang Buddhas Namu Tas Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sang Buddhas Namu Tas Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sang Buddhas Honor to the Buddha, to the Dhamma and Sangha. May all beings near or far, known or unknown, seen or unseen, and be well, be happy, and be peaceful. And may all of us too be well, be happy, and peaceful. Suki Hontu. Most Venerable Dr. Punaji Mahathir, Most Venerable Bodhicitta Teri, uh, Acharya Vijay, dear friends, tonight I'm here to honor and to pay tribute to our late Venerable Kirindi Sri Damananda Naika Mahathir, who had been the abbot of this Buddhist Mahavihara for a very long time, more than half a century. And tomorrow, supposedly his 99th birthday. So at the end of the talk, I would like to invite everyone to remember him and his contributions to the Buddha Sasana and to the Buddhist development uh, in this country and uh, to dedicate merits uh, in his memory. Maybe we can have the echo of this reduced so that it is clearer. Or maybe I have to change my voice so that it's clearer. But since I can't change my voice so fast, it's easier to reduce the echo. So today we have prepared some uh, notes following from the two weeks ago when we had our first uh, Dhammapada uh, session where we discussed a few verses from the Buddha Vaga. Two weeks ago we explained who was the Buddha, what is the Dhamma, and what is Sangha, and why do we go for refuge? the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. What is the significance? What is the way? What is not the way? So today, I would like to invite everyone to also contemplate on a few more verses from the same chapter, from the chapter on the Buddha, or in Pali, we call it the Buddha Vaga. Yeah. So what we are going to do tonight is to go through the few verses and to learn how to pronounce it in Pali. I think a lot of people are here very interested to also learn a few words, uh, common words uh, in Pali language, and to also know the meaning and to interpret it collect correctly and uh, without any uh, uh, distortion uh, of the Dhamma. Okay. So everyone has got a piece of the notes. I'd like to start by saying or repeating what we said last time, that whatever the Buddha taught is for our well-being and happiness. The Buddha said, Bahu jana hitaya, bahu jana sukhaya, loka nukampaya. Bahu jana, many people, for their well-being, hitaya, hita means well-being. When we are feeling well in terms of our physical health, mental health, spirits, 
spirituality. When we are feeling well, naturally we also feel very happy. We feel very satisfied in life, very fulfilling life. So, whatever the Buddha taught out of compassion for the world is for our well-being and for our happiness. And the Buddha taught a lot of good Dhamma. The Buddha taught a vast number of ways for us to experience happiness. If we pick up any of the Buddha's teachings and apply it in our lives, just practice it, we will feel very happy. If you just pick up dana, just by being generous, just by being selfless, sharing whatever you have with others, you will experience that happiness. If you pick up precepts, sustained practice of precepts, sila, you will experience anavaja, sukha, because all the actions are blameless. If we practice bhavana, development of the mind, meditation, mind becomes very calm, tranquil, and clear. We experience great happiness. There is not one practice the Buddha taught that if taken up brings us unhappiness. So therefore, this teaching is a real treasure. This Dhamma is truly a treasure. We call it Dhamma Ratanang, the treasure of the Dhamma. Because anything we pick up, anything we practice, anything we apply in our lives, brings us happiness and clears away unhappiness. But we have to practice. If we only worship without understanding, without applying in our lives, then we do not benefit from being close to the Dhamma. It's just like how the Buddha described even if the spoon were to dip in so many kinds of soup and gravy and curry, the spoon doesn't understand any of those tastes. Although it is near to it, deep into it, but would not understand the taste. Why? Because the spoon did not absorb the gravy or the curry. Similarly, when we only worship the Dhamma, without really understanding or applying it, without practicing it, we are not far better than before we did all that. So anyone who wants to approach the Dhamma, approach it correctly, learn it properly, and then apply it in our daily life diligently. And then we experience joy and freedom from worries and from anxieties. And over a long time, we experience greater and deeper happiness. There are three kinds of happiness. One kind of happiness is that which we experience here and now. It's called Dita Dhamma Sukha. Here and now in this very life, we enjoy that happiness. Hmm? For example, Comfort, sensual enjoyment of many kinds. When people give you something, give you a meal, a very good meal, we feel very happy, we feel very satisfied. That is a kind of comfort, that's a kind of happiness that we experience in this life. Then there are finer happiness in this life. Instead of the happiness of receiving, some people experience an even finer happiness of giving. The happiness of giving is even finer than receiving things. When we receive things and we feel happy, similarly we may feel unhappy when we don't receive things. Today we receive from our friend, we feel very happy. Tomorrow we are asking for it. Friend forgot to give. Didn't show up. We feel disappointed. Whatever happiness, when we wish for it, yang pi chang na lapati tang dukang. Whatever we wish for, tak boleh dapat susah hati. Keksim, cannot get. But when we cut away that kind of craving, instead we develop sharing, we develop 
a caring attitude, we develop generosity. That kind of happiness we experience is even more refined. But all this has to do with the experience in this life. The second type of happiness is Samparahaya Sukha. After this life also we can experience. And that depends on living a wholesome life performing meritorious deeds. The Buddha said, Ida nandati, pecha nandati, katta punyo bhayata nandati, punyame katangti nandati, bio nandati sugatingatu. Here we are very happy. We experience happiness in this life. Here after, after this life, there's a second kind of happiness, samparaya sukha. Katta punyo bhayata nandani. Nandati, if we have done good in both existences, in this existence and the next existence, we experience happiness. Beyond Nandati, beyond happiness, beyond experience in the joy, Sugatingato, we also can be reborn in a fortunate state if we have done meritorious deeds and lived a wholesome life. But these two types of happiness cannot compare in any way with the third kind of happiness. The third kind of happiness is called Nibbana Sukha. It is not based on enjoying the fruits of giving or, or keeping precepts or material enjoyment. It is the happiness after we have eradicated all our defilements. When we don't have defilements, we don't have the causes of suffering. When we don't have the causes of suffering, we do not experience any suffering. That liberation, freedom from suffering is the ultimate happiness. Nibbana paramang sukham. That's the highest happiness. So these three kinds of happiness, you can categorize the first two as ordinary happiness. The third type of happiness is considered extraordinary. So which one have we experienced in our life? I think almost everyone, if not everyone here, because they are all good people, on Friday night, despite the traffic jam and rain, come to listen to Dhamma talk, so must be good people. We experience the happiness that is ordinary. But the Buddha said, ordinary kind of happiness is anichang. Yat anichang tang dukang. Whatever is impermanent, whatever that we cannot sustain for long, whatever we cannot keep without changing, that is unsatisfactory. Therefore, the Buddha always urged practitioners to go beyond ordinary happiness. The Buddha says, if you can find a greater happiness, then let go of the lesser ones. When we let go of the lesser ones, we can experience the greater ones, the greater happiness. So remember that for the beginning and forever, that whatever the Buddha taught, it is for our freedom from defilements, freedom from suffering and for our well-being and for our happiness. So that brings us to our topic of discussion, these few verses that we had tonight. As uh, usual, for the Dhammapada, there are always occasions when the Buddha uttered these verses. And the history of these verses, when the Buddha said, was during one Uposata day. You know what is Uposata day? Hmm? Uposata day? Yeah. Any Buddhists here? <laughs> <laughs> Uposata means observance. You know, these observant days originally were one day before the new moon, one day before the full moon, these were the times when religious people observe rituals and perform rites and ceremonies. So they were pre-Buddhistic observance days. Now today we observe the new moon 
and the full moon. But in the ancient days, Uposata days were one day before this new moon and the full moon. So Buddha's attendant, Venerable Ananda, noticed other groups, other religious groups, and they were not just one group, the Buddhists, they were non-Buddhist religious groups, just like today. India was very uh, pluralistic religiously. During the time of the Buddha, there were no less than 62 different religious philosophies or religious sects, religious groups. There were no less than 62 philosophy or religion that were active in India. Some had many followers. So people were generally quite religious, even today in India. So the Buddha's attendant, Ananda, noticed people were observing different kinds of rites and ceremonies. And he wanted to know whether in the past, the Buddhas in ancient times, did they also observe such oposatades? Because at the present time, Ananda, he was a monk, he was following the Buddha, but the Buddha didn't do anything special on Oposata days. He didn't conduct ceremonies like other groups. He didn't have rites and rituals on those days. Every day was the same. So Ananda wanted to find out from the Buddha whether Buddhas in ancient times did anything to observe Oposata days. Whether the Buddhas in the past taught the same doctrine or not. And this is a very important point. Whether Buddhas in the past taught different doctrines or the same doctrines like the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Whether Buddhas in the future will teach the same doctrine or something extra. Maybe today Buddha will have to teach something extra for us to get rid of our craving and obsession with social media. There must be a new meditation object to help us with that obsession. So he wanted to find out whether all Buddhas teach the same or some taught differently. And Buddha Gautama affirmed by declaring, he said, all Buddhas in the past, at present, and even those in future who teach the same doctrine because they realize Dhamma. The Buddhas in the past realize Dhamma. That's why they are Buddhas. Buddhas means enlightened ones or awake ones, those that are awake. They are not awakened because nobody woke them up but they became awake. So Buddhas are those that are awake from the slumber of ignorance and delusion. That's why the root word Buddh means one who knows, one who is wise, one who understands. Buddha. So all Buddhas in the past and Buddhas in the present, they realize the Dhamma. The Dhamma is what naturally occurs in the form of natural laws, including the law of causation, the law of nature, and so on. And the Buddha realized the Dhamma and taught the Dhamma. The Buddha didn't teach many of the things we are practicing today. The Buddha realized the Dhamma and taught pure Dhamma. Generations of Buddhists later on added many things that are culture-bound, that are uh, bound by tradition or borrowed from other traditions. And when Buddhism spread all over Asia to Sri Lanka, certain pre-Buddhistic elements were incorporated. When it came to Southeast Asia, you know, Southeast Asian practices were incorporated. When it went to India, uh, spread all over India. Indian gods become Buddhist gods. 
this happen organically. So today we have a variety of Buddhist philosophies and Buddhist practices. But during Buddha's time, it was purely Dhamma. So the Buddha affirmed, he told Ananda, he declared, that all Buddhas from the past to the present, they all realized Dhamma and taught the Dhamma. And on Uposatha days, sometimes the Buddhas would recite these verses. So these few verses from the chapter on the Buddha were actually uh, uttered by Buddhas past and present as a summary of the doctrine. So they are very important. So I thought tonight it is good that all of us get acquainted in the Buddha's own words what is the summary of the teachings. So they are verses 183, 184, and 185. They were spoken uh, together on the same occasion. So look at the original Pali text and uh, learn how to pronounce. Yeah? Sabba papasa akaranang. Very good, you sound very Indian. <laughs> Sabba, when we have a double consonant, both are audible. Sabba papasa. Very good, very accurate. Pa, pa, sa. When we have an A with a ba on top, it is a long vowel, ah. Yeah. So without that, it's a, uh, but with uh, A with a ba on top, is long vowel, long sound, ah. Okay. Akaranang. Not akaranam, but akaranang. Kusalasa Upasampadha Satchitta Pariyoda Panang Panang Etang Not etam, but etang Buddhana Sasanang Buddhan. The D and the DH, they are two different letters, two different consonants. So the H is audible, it's Buddha. Buddhan. Sasanang. Okay. Kanti. Paramang. Tapo titika. Nibbanang paramang Vadhanti buddha Nahi pabbajito Parupa ghati Samanohoti Parang vihethayanto Anupavado Anupaghato Pati Mukhe Cha Sangwaro Mata Nyutta Now this sound is Nyu Mata Nyutta Cha Bhattasming Pantang Cha sayana sanang Adi chitte Cha ayogo Etang buddhana sasanang Please go back and read 108 times. And remember and memorize this stanza because future Buddhas are going to say the same thing. So when you happen to meet future Buddhas, future Buddhists, at least you have the common wavelength. Yeah. 
Now, what is the meaning of these three verses? Now, all the meanings of the individual words, we, we just give a summary. Yeah? I never give the grammatical form and the declension and so on because this is not a Pali language class. So it's not very crucial that we get into very detail without uh, getting uh, what you call to bog down by technicality. Let's focus on the spirituality. Sometimes we should not focus too much on the technicality, but the spirituality of the Dhamma is very important. So you can go back and look at all these words. But what is the meaning in English? It is found, thankfully, in the page behind. Verse 183, and this is quite common, is it not to commit any evil, to cultivate the good, and to purify one's own mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. In Buddha's own words, Sabbapapasa karanangkusala saupasampada sachitta pariyodapanang ittabodana sasana. This is the translation, what it meant. You know, not to commit any evil. So in Chinese also, this is very uh, famous. You know, many people know how to recite it, except don't know how to practice it. Uh, okay, I won't mention the Hokkien one. <laughs> not to commit any evil. Now, I put here uh, footnote number one. Evil is too heavy a word here, but this is the perhaps an apt translation. It is not a wrong translation, but we have to qualify it. We have to explain what it meant here when we use the, the word evil. If you look at the Pali, sabba, sabba means all. Huh? Sabba. Apasa, akaranam. Now, firstly, we understand this word papa. What is papa? Papa means poorer, worse off, defiled, unwholesome, you know, make us less wholesome. So this is the meaning of the word papa. You know. Whatever that is unwholesome, this is the meaning, papa. What is the meaning of unwholesomeness? Whatever we do out of avarice, whatever we do out of greed, whatever we do that we have selfish desires, we call it lobha, that is considered unwholesome. Whatever we do out of aversion, out of ill will, out of wanting to hurt or to harm others, out of enmity, that is papa, that is unwholesome. Whatever we do out of foolishness, out of stupidity, out of ignorance, out of delusion, out of wrong views, that is also papa. So whatever that we commit, whatever we commit with our body, with our speech, and even through thinking, yeah, because these are the th three doors of karma. Karma is not just performed by the body, it is also by speech and also by intention. Whatever that we perform with these three unwholesome roots of craving, aversion and delusion, that is considered unwholesome, that is papa. You know? Whatever we perform that makes our character a poorer one, that is papa. In Malay, papa means poorer. Yeah? It still contains the original meaning of the Pali. In Malay, we have the, the term Papa Miskin. Huh? Ada orang miskin sini? Ada orang miskin? Semua kaya ya? <laughs> orang kaya. Huh? Kaya raya. Papa Miskin. Not to say Papa not rich. Papa's meaning is our character becomes poorer. Why our character can become poorer? Because of our foolishness. We do things that make our uh, character more avaricious, more angry, more 
defiled, more agitated, more unpeaceful, more stained, more difficult to purify later. So that is papa. So sabba, papa, sa, a karanang. A means don't. Karanang, don't do. Don't commit, don't do, don't perform anything that causes our character to become more defiled, to become lesser than what we can be. You know? Now, we are all trying to improve ourselves. We are all trying to keep our morality. We are all trying to develop our virtue. But at the same time, when we are unmindful, we also can do things that make ourselves you know, uh, more defiled. We put ourselves in danger, in danger of falling down to states of unhappiness, in danger of uh, having a stream of unwholesome thoughts, unwholesome speech, unwholesome actions. So this is the norm for beings in samsara. This is the uncertainty of samsara. Anicca means impermanence, but it also means uncertainty. Na icca, which is impermanent, but at the same time there is no certainty in impermanence. There is no certainty in samsara. So as long as beings trying to be good, trying to be happy, why do we try to be good? Because that is the path to happiness. Why do we avoid being unwholesome? Because unwholesomeness is the path to ruin and unhappiness. When we can keep ourselves from doing all these unwholesome deeds, we are keeping ourselves safe from being unhappy. We are keeping ourselves from ruin. So this is the teaching of the Buddha. First, we have to really be mindful and avoid abstain and restrain ourselves from all unwholesome deeds. Yeah. Then, kusalasa upasampada. Upasampada means to cultivate, to take upon. To take upon what? Kusala. What is kusala? Kusala here doesn't mean just good. I put that good in inverted commas in the translation. Kusala doesn't mean good. Yeah, many people say, oh, that's easy. I do good every day. You see, I do good every day. I just give to some charity because every month I have titi. <laughs> what do you call that? Bank transfer. So technically every moment you are doing good because it's automatic, right? Yeah. Then Fridays I come to attend talks, no matter what, that's good. And then I offer dana and then so on. It's easy to do good, isn't it? It's not difficult. Even bad people can do good. I used to share in my town, the most generous people who always give to schools and uh, what you call old folks home and uh, what, different kinds of uh, charities. Yeah. The, those that are most supportive and most generous, they are the, the developers, the local developers. The second most uh, generous group are the gangsters. <laughs> the alongs. <laughs> easy money so they just you know this is the truth you know so even people who create a lot of harm to society can still do good you know people who who are murderers in their intent swindle and cheat others from their property they can go and donate blood they can donate tens of thousands they can they can help a person uh, feed people who, who are needy. So here, it doesn't mean doing good. It means being good. It means being skillful. Kusala literally means skillfulness. And kusala, skillfulness, means how do you get closer to freeing yourself from defilements? That's called skillfulness. If we were not skillful, we would not be able to free ourselves from defilements. We would go around, do a lot of things, thinking that we are performing a lot of charity, but none the better, for we cannot free ourselves from the causes of suffering, which are defilements. So skillfulness, kusala here means, do you know what can free us from further stains of defilements? Can we free ourselves from those defilements? What are the qualities 
that allow us to free ourselves from defilements. And here, kusala can be defined as the factors of enlightenment, for example. How many factors of enlightenment are there? Seven. Or it could be the 37 factors that are conducive for enlightenment. We call it bodhipakya dhamma. There are 37 of them, the Buddha said. You know, or the seven sata bojanga, the seven factors of enlightenment, starting with sati, starting with mindful awareness, starting with living a different way, rather than living driven by habits and driven by craving. You know, follow the nose, follow the mind. Here we follow the dhamma. Living by following the dhamma means being mindful and aware. Aware of what? Aware of body aware of feelings and sensations, thoughts and mental states. So sati is a quality that is conducive for freeing ourselves from stain. This is to be taken up. This is called kusala. Kusala sa upasampada means take up this practice. Be mindful. Take up mindfulness as our daily practice. Make it our yana. Yana means our mode of practice, our way of life. Besides sati, what other factors of enlightenment are there? Second factor is called dhamma vichaya. Dhamma vichaya means investigating, using dhamma, reflecting upon dhamma, contemplating using dhamma. You know, maybe when we investigate, not investigate the dhamma by checking dictionary. Seeing the dhamma within the body, Body has sensation. Sensations include pain. Is pain permanent or impermanent? How do you know? Oh, because I read last night. The book says so. Dhamma vichaya means I know because I was paying attention to it. When I was experiencing pain, I notice, I become aware and I stay with it for a while and the pain just comes and goes and disappears after some time. When the pain gets tired, it disappears. That was how I discovered that pain was impermanent. Ah, dukang anichang. This pain is impermanent. How about pleasure? Oh, I also, during my birthday, people gave me very nice food. I tasted, wow, I feel so happy. After a few seconds, the taste disappeared from my mouth. I didn't taste it anymore. Then I took another scoop. And after I finished the whole bowl, there was no more to pleasurize my mouth, my palate. And it disappeared. Oh, that's how I realized pleasure was impermanent. And this is how we investigate the Dhamma. Not open the scripture and check whether it is correct spelling or not. Check whether it is correct translation or not. Dhamma vichaya means within ourselves, living in, the, in nature, discover the nature of nature. Discover what is this life about. Whether it is permanent or not, whether it is satisfactory or not, and so on. So this will free us from attachment to things that we now know are impermanent. When we realize for ourselves that pleasure is impermanent, the next time when that pleasure disappears, we say, ah, that's the nature. And when we experience pain or numbness or boredom that is unpleasant, because we realize that, that pain, numbness or boredom, they are also impermanent, we are not so bothered. When we get sick, we are not so panicky. We can accept. Because we can accept, there is no attachment or craving for comfort. Nowadays, people are very scared. You know, people just, just came to tell me just a few days ago, say, they are going for surgery, so ask for blessings. That's my part-time job. <laughs> so monks and nuns are busy sometimes, so we also get some subcontract. Things. <laughs> I say, what surgery are you going to? Oh, I feel immense pain and so on and so on. I say, oh, okay, okay. How long have you felt the pain? Oh, for the past few, few months already. It's very painful. 
Okay. How old are you? I'm 77. I say, it's natural to get that pain, huh? At your age. I was just thinking. But people nowadays, they don't understand. It comes in a package. You don't experience it when you're 17. But when you're 77, you're bound to experience something. This is something that we can realize and we are not so obsessed about it. You know, many people say, oh, I, I lack energy. I always feel sleeping. If you're 27 and, and experiencing that, better go and check up. But if you're 97 and experiencing lethargy, you shouldn't go for any operation. You shouldn't go and you know, get yourself uh, thoroughly checked and uh, inject this or inject that because when people age, they are bound to get more tired, more lethargic. They do a little bit of work, then they say, oh, it's enough for me, I need to rest. Slow down the pace. That's natural. When you are 80, 90, 100 years old, if we cannot accept that, that means we cannot understand. This comes in a package. That package you cannot negotiate. That's nature. So, this is something that we can free ourselves from craving and free ourselves from aversion. The, the Buddha says in the Satipatthana Sutta, whenever we have these kind of sensations, whether pain or pleasure, Vedana, Vedanu, Pasing, Viharate, Vinne, Loke, Abhijan, Dumanasam. When we experience all these sensations or feelings, happy, uh, pleasant or unpleasant, we do not develop attachment towards it. Apijang means craving towards it. Craving with desire to prolong it, to keep it with us. That's apijang. Nor we develop domanasang, aversion and unhappiness towards things that are unpleasant and uncomfortable. We just don't arouse craving, don't arouse aversion because these two are the roots of suffering. When we don't further arouse roots of suffering, we free ourselves from causes of suffering and therefore free ourselves from more suffering in future. This is how we reduce our suffering. This is called practice, by the way. This is called cultivation. So the, the purpose of cultivating is to understand this and not to develop the causes for our future suffering. So this too is kusala how we can investigate the Dhamma and then arrive at that realization. It may be a small realization, but it is called spiritual progress. What other factors of enlightenment do you know? Besides mindfulness and investigating the Dhamma? What else? Yeah? Oh, yes, virya, effort or vigor. Yeah? That's spirit. You know? Virya means different things in different contexts. But generally, it means an enthusiasm towards Dhamma. Now, many people are enthusiastic when it comes to worldly enjoyment, but when it comes to Dhamma, besok uh, lusa. Always postpone. We need that kind of zeal when we meditate. When we meditate also, oh, feel happy for ourselves. Feel happy that I know meditation. I've, I've been introduced to meditation. I have this chance to meditate. And feel happy to listen to the Dhamma. Feel happy to do something good. That is generally the spirit we call virya, vigor. Yeah, virya in English is called vigor. It, it gives rise to enthusiasm. It gives rise to energy and making effort. That's virya. Again, a very important uh, factor of enlightenment is piti. Piti means joy. You know, Dhamma is very joyful. Like meditating, if we can experience the joy, meditation, then we will take it up you know, with a lot of happiness. When we sit there and say, oh, this is dukkha. You know, Maha dukkha. Paramang dukkhang. Yes. We won't go far. We won't go all out. You know? We will go down and out. You know? So, 
this pity when, when we do good and when we see others. You know, one way of getting pity is also to rejoice in seeing others doing good. You know, you see people sit in front here, feel rejoice for them. So, you, know, you see people doing good, people paying attention, people meditating, people uh, offering things at the altar and the Bodhi tree, feel happy for them. This is slowly, cumulatively, feeling the joy of seeing good, appreciating what is good, and approaching good, and becoming good. If you don't appreciate what is good in the first place, how can you eventually become good? When we don't even appreciate the goodness when we see or witness, we don't even notice that it is good. Many people develop delusion. They see what is not good as good, but they see what is good as nothing good. So that is a defilement, the defilement of ignorance and delusion. You know, that doesn't make us any freer from suffering. That makes the condition ripe for future suffering. That is called wrong views, wrong thoughts. So any of the factors of enlightenment when we practice, that is called kusalas upasampada. So my dear friends, it is not just I will go and do some charitable acts, I will go and do something good. No, it is I will learn how to become good, how to become skillful. Skillful means get closer to purity, to get away from defilements. Right? That's why I put the good in inverted commas. So please take note of that. Yeah? And this is the way the Buddha says to purify one's own mind. Sa means himself. Sa chitta, his own mind. Pariyoda panang, to cleanse and to purify. Now, when we abstain and refrain from anything unwholesome, then we cultivate skillful factors and values that purify us it sets the condition for us to be able to purify our own minds. Yeah. So it is a very natural process. So we always say the quality of our life is the quality of our minds. The quality of our lives is the quality of our minds. When our mind is full of greed and desire, wanting so many things, and this is the, the, one of the great disease, disease of the modern age, the disease of the mind is it wants too many things. It wants too many material things. Yeah? That's why people don't have time. They have to work very hard. Why do they have to work hard? Hmm? Because it's very competitive. You have to earn your, your, your money and you have to earn a lot. Why? Because my colleagues also all earn a lot. And so do my neighbors. Yeah? And why do you need to earn so much money? Because I have many wants. I have many things I desire. I, I need to own that. I need to buy that. I need to pay for that. I need to pay installment for other things. There are too many things. So our life becomes very busy and we don't have time because there are many desires. Now, just imagine, if we have lessened our desires, then we don't need to... Uh, pay so much yeah, to stay happy. And when we don't have to pay so much to stay happy, we can uh, stop working all the time to earn that much. And when we don't have to work all the time to earn that much, we'll have some spare time. And that spare time can be used beneficially, can be used productively, and Productively doesn't mean pro produce more money, but produce more goodness, produce more wisdom, produce more time and space and peace and comfort and tranquility. That becomes productive spiritually, and then you are so much happier and better off. Correct or not? You see? So contentment is one virtue, one very essential condition for us to develop if we are keen to embark on the spiritual life.
Spiritual life doesn't mean become renunciants, monks and nuns only, but having spirituality in our lives, being a, a happier person, we need to develop this essential quality of uh, contentment. Having fewer desires, and you will have much more time. Yeah? So, this is how the whole process from abstaining from doing evil uh, to cultivating the skillful qualities, the noble qualities, and this is naturally the way to purify one's own mind. And the Buddha used this term, sa citta. The Buddha didn't say citta pariyoda panam. The Buddha was very careful. He said sa citta, one's own mind, because you cannot purify another's mind. Sudi asudi patsatang nanyuanyang visodai. Purity and impurity depends on oneself. We cannot purify another. Have you a relative or a friend or a colleague who is suffering from obsession in certain thoughts, thinking that you know people have been unfair to them and so on? And after deducing all the facts, think that they are overthinking, think that they are mistaken in their views, think that they have misunderstood the whole situation, and you try to counsel them and try to you know, pacify them and so on, but it doesn't work. Even after many years, their obsession makes them very unhappy. Yeah. So can you take out their mind and purify it? Nah. After servicing, give it back to them. Like service your car engine. Yeah. Can we do that? We can service the fridge, television, computer, and automobiles, but we cannot service another person's mind. We can counsel them comfort them, guide them, even teach them, even admonish them. But one thing we cannot do is to purify another person's mind. The body we may clean. Just like another object, the body is something material we can clean. But we cannot cleanse the mind of another being. Otherwise, the Buddha wouldn't need to teach so much. When you go to him, just sprinkle some water and recite some mantra and tap tap on your head, that's it. You are enlightened. No. The Buddha did that. All he did for 45 years until Kama cannot carry him anymore. The Buddha did all that because one's purity or impurity cannot be determined by another. So we have to apply this Dhamma ourselves. We cannot say, my guru is very famous, you know. You know I surname Tangan or Lim, or Chan, or Vijay, or Sakya. No matter how great the, the Guru's reputation, Buddha already said, cannot purify you. You might feel something. Eventually that may be conceit also. My Guru is great, therefore you know, I feel very secure. That itself, that defilement itself, we cannot see. That impurity itself we cannot see. How to hope for purification from the Guru? See. Our Maha Guru behind me, all our Gurus, this is the Maha, Maha, Maha Guru. He said this, Sudhi Asudhi Pachata. Purity and impurity depends on ourselves, our effort, our right views and our actions. No one can purify another. So that's why the Buddha says to purify one's own mind. And this is the teaching of all enlightened ones. All enlightened beings, not those who claim enlightenment, but truly enlightened beings, they have discovered the same Dhamma and the path to purity. That's the same path. There's no other path that Maitreya Buddha is going to introduce. It's the Noble Eightfold Path. We can be very sure of that because in the past, the Buddha Kashyapa and the Buddha Gotama had reiterated it's the straight path which is known to us as the Noble Eightfold Path. So we don't have to wait until Maitreya Buddha comes because it's the same Dhamma. Yeah. It's the same advice we are going to get. So if you remember tonight's lesson and when you meet Maitreya and he repeats the same and say, I learned that at the Buddhist Mahavihara. <laughs> And Maitreya will ask you, then what took you so long to understand that? <laughs> it has been like 
104 kapas. So what took you so long? Yeah. And the Buddha continued. He didn't just stop there. The Buddha said, Kanti paramang tapo titika. Patience, forbearance is the greatest or the highest discipline, self-discipline, austerity. The Buddha did, didn't um, mean austerity or tapa as in the way of others practicing uh, what you call self-mortification. The Buddha did not agree with that kind of austere, in inverted commas, austere practices by torturing your body, by seeming noble, uh, not caring for your body. I'm so not attached to my body, therefore I don't care about it. Therefore I don't eat enough, I don't bathe, I don't clean it, I don't rest, I don't sleep. Uh, I just basically don't have any attachment to the body. The Buddha did not agree with that. The Buddha thought that was an extreme to be avoided. Atakila mata nu yogo, dukho anario anatta sanghito, the Buddha said. It is profitless if you go to that extreme. So the Buddha had a very healthy view of our body, how to use it. So he did not agree with that kind of austerity. But the tapo here, the, the Pali word tapo is very interesting because it means burning up. Tiosio, burning up. In Hokkien, it's more accurate. Sio <laughs> kile. Burning what? Burning away our defilements. That is the meaning. So this is the discipline needed to burn away our defilements. Our defilements can actually multiply. So from one wrong uh, thought, one misunderstanding, one wrong view, we develop wrong thoughts, wrong speech, action, livelihood. We don't have right effort. We, we, we simply don't have any effort towards liberation. So from something wrong, the defilements can quickly multiply. But at the same time, if the practice is right, then the defilements can also be burnt away. So this is the word tapa, why it appears here. Titika means to endure. So patience, the Buddha said, kanti, is the highest self-control or discipline. It's the highest practice of discipline. Kanti. You know, what is kanti? Kanti means being able to bear with situations or people we dislike. You know, if we don't have kanti, we get either angry or annoyed, both of which are defilements. If we get annoyed, that's aversion too. That's dosa. If we get angry, that is aversion too. That is dosa. So, without getting annoyed or angry, that is called patience. When we are face to face with a situation or a person that we don't like, we don't enjoy. When we have that kind of patience, we don't develop dosha or craving for another ideal situation. We just observe and accept with kanti. We can do that. So after time, it weakens the root of dosha. It burns away the dosha. It burns away the annoyance, burns away the anger. This is how kanti burns away our defilements. If we can endure that, then that is the highest austerity, the Buddha says. See, a lot of people just don't have patience. You know? So kanti is one of the parami or paramita, one of the perfections that every being had to undertake, undergo, in order for total enlightenment. Samasambuddhahood. So Kanti Parami is one of the perfections. So the Buddha said, if one wants to practice self-control discipline, the highest form of that is Kanti, patience. And why is that so? Because the Buddha says, Nibbana is supreme. Yeah. Nibbana Paramang Vadanti Buddha. Nibbana means freedom, Unbinding. Unbinding to what? 
unbinding to the unwholesome roots, unbinding to anger, unbinding to ignorance, unbound to all the things. How to unbind ourselves from the roots of unwholesomeness? It is by practicing patience, by not indulging our unwholesomeness, by not indulging our anger. Every time when, when the situation, uh, what you call, is challenging, we indulge ourselves with anger. We indulge ourselves in annoyance. We increase the defilements. That is why it is deeper and deeper rooted. But when we practice patience, it decreases the binding of that defilement. And we can pull it up one day. So, Nibbana is the highest unbinding, the highest happiness, the Buddha says. Nibbana paramang sukang. And all Buddhas, they attain this Nibbana. And that is the highest attainment, says all Buddhas. Not just one Buddha, all Buddhas say Nibbana, unbinding, is the highest attainment. You can attain a heavenly bath. You can attain the first stage of sainthood. You can attain a second or third stage of sainthood. But the Buddha says there is no greater attainment than Nibbana, the total cessation of defilements and suffering. And the Buddha says, Patavya ekarajina sagasa gamaninava sabaloka dipachena sota pati pahalangvaram. When even we understand the beginning, the path to Nibbana, that is greater than all the other attainments in worldly terms. You, know, you can be the prime minister of the country or the president of the states, but that is nothing compared to the attainment of even going into the path towards Nibbana. So Nibbana Paramang Vadandi Buddha. Remember that, everyone. Remember. So remember every time when we attain something, some peace, some uh, concentration from our practice, don't be conceited. We have to tell ourselves, I have embarked on this path. It is good that I can experience such serenity and tranquility, such mindfulness, even such jhana. But this is not Nibbana as yet. I should not stop halfway. I should go all the way, all the way, all the way. Why? Nibbana Paramang Vadhanti Buddha. Nibbana is the paramount, so declares all Buddha. Repeat after me. Nibbana Paramang Vadhanti Buddha. Nibbana Paramang Vadhanti Buddha. Go back 108 times <laughs> before supper. Yeah? Nibbana is highest. So, so says, so declares all the Buddha. Then he continues. Nahi, Nahi, you know, if you watch Indian movie, Nahi Pabajito Parupagati. You know, Pabajita means what you call a recluse, a person who has renounced the worldly life. He, the renunciation of the worldly life is called Pabaja. So, a person who has renounced the worldly life is called Pabajita. You know. Nahi Pabajita. One is not a renunciant, one is not a recluse, one is not a practitioner of Dhamma, one is not even serious in practicing Dhamma if he harms or injures another. If we still have the intention to harm, to injure, to hurt another, then we have not even begun to understand what is practice. How can we hurt or injure another person? We can injure through our action, physical action, through our speech, which is the most common, and even through our thoughts. Yeah? Planning and scheming. Tomorrow when I see him, I am first going to open, my opening statement is like that. If he answers me this way, then I'm going to hurt him like this. If he answers another way, I'm going to harm him like that. Even through our scheming, through our thoughts, we can be harming others. But in the whole process, did not you discover that we harm ourselves most? Did we not 
pay attention who is most injured. So how can a person who wants to practice, who wants to be free from suffering, be injuring others because at the same time he is injuring his potential for freedom from suffering. He is increasing his own causes of suffering. He has planted numerous seeds for future suffering. Extraordinary suffering, not ordinary. How can we say we are serious about practice? So a person who is a renunciant, a recluse, a practitioner, or one intent to practice Dharma should not even want to harm or to injure, to hurt another person, because we understand. We understand by hurting others, this is planting seed of suffering. By hurting ourselves, we plant the seed of suffering. Yet we say we want to be free from suffering. How can that be? This is the paradox. If we keep on hurting others, then the Buddha says, Nahi Pabajito, you are not a recluse. You are not a practitioner of Dhamma. That's a very strong statement, the Buddha says. And he further says, Nahi Samano Hoti. Nahi Samano Hoti. This Nahi is shared between this. Nahi Pabajito, Nahi Samano Hoti. You are not a, what you call a Samana. A Samana means an ascetic. The translation, an ascetic, is also a practitioner of Dhamma. Samu, Samu means to peace, to make our hearts tranquil, not burning, burning with the fire of what? Fire of desire, burning with the fire of anger, burning with the fire of delusion. So one who appeases these three fires, he is called a Samana. So one is not a Samana if parang, other people, vehe thayanto oppressed or being hostile to or having ill will uh, or having enmity towards another being. It may not even be human. It, it may be uh, non-human. It may be a group of people. It may be people from another political party. It may be people from another race. It may be people from another religion. It may be people from another country. People have this enmity and prejudice uh, all the time without knowing. You know, this is how racism has its roots and so on. Because we want to oppress others. We don't like them, therefore we don't enjoy seeing them uh, winning the Thomas Cup or Uber Cup. You know, we, we want to win. We don't, we don't want to see our enemies win. We hope they lose. And we hope they lose badly. Mm -hmm. So th there's a lot of prejudice in our minds. All these prejudice, what is the root? Unwholesome roots. The roots of ignorance. These are defilements. So when we want to oppress other people or being hostile to them, how can we be at peace? How can we be at peace? How can we be samu? Samu means tranquil, cool. We are not cool at all. We are far from being cool. So for the young people, if you want to be cool, Don't oppress others. When we oppress others, we create defilements in our mind. The defilement of conceit, the defilement of pride, and the defilement of prejudice. It's all due to ignorance. See? So, parang vehetayanto, to oppress others, then it makes us not a samana. And the Buddha further elaborated, he said, Anu bhavado. Anu anu an here means uh, the negative. Yeah, in Pali, like uh, na icha becomes anicha, na atta becomes anatta. So na upavado becomes anupavado. So not insulting. Yeah, how can you insult others? Actually, no need to ask because we are half of here are experts. <laughs> How do we insult others? In many ways, right? Through action, through speech, and even through thoughts, right? Even through body language, right? How can we insult others? Many creative ways. <laughs> you know, advertisements can be insulting to others. 
you know, songs can be insulting to others, art can be insulting to others, rituals can be insulting to others, you know. Uh, sitting position, I'm so insulting, I'm sitting so high, and you're sitting there. Okay. You know, we, we have many spheres, many, many ways if we want to insult others. The opposite is to exalt others. This one is to make others seem lower, to insult them in order to hurt them. If they don't feel quite hurt, we become more creative. <laughs> oh, no longer sensitive to this remark. So I will change my tense, become present tense. Hmm? <laughs> change a verb, uh, change, a, change a language so that it wraps it in, so that it feels it. And when the person aches a bit, is it, we get satisfaction out of it. That's so sadistic. But unfortunately, that's so common. That's way too common. And we are not even aware of it. That is the danger. So now, by living a very mindful life, we know, oh, am I insulting or not? Am I insulting or not? We become more careful. And the, the word careful contains the word care. It means to care for others. Careful doesn't mean careful, I don't make good, bad karma. You know, I want to maintain my good karma only. I want Nibbana, Nibbana, Paramang, Vadanti Buddha. I remember 108 times I did last night. It's not caring for oneself. It's having care for others too. It's called compassion. You see? So being careful is being caring too. You see? It's not... Whether I, I should make mistakes, I shouldn't make any mistakes. I should avoid all mistakes. No. So I should avoid insults. I shouldn't insult others. If I'm serious about practicing Dhamma, not insulting, anupagato, not oppressing, yeah. not harming. Upagata means to harm. And again, we can harm a person in many, many ways. Yeah. So not insulting, not harming, Pati moke ce sangvaro. Sangvaro means to restrain ourselves, to restrain our action, our speech, and our thoughts and intention according to the fundamental discipline of being kind, being nice, being thoughtful, being compassionate, being wise. That is the foundation of the fundamental discipline. It's called pati moke. There is a technical meaning to pati moke. And this is for renunciants, uh, for monks and for nuns. Bhikkhu Patimoka. They have their Patimoka, meaning the monastic code of discipline. Yeah, it is codified. This is the precept, this is the precept that I should uh, avoid breaking and so on. But here, Patimoka in the most uh, widest sense means fundamental discipline. Yeah. The same word we use, Vinaya. You know what's Vinaya? Huh? What is Vinaya? Huh? Rules? No, Vinaya are not rules. Vinaya means discipline. Yeah? It actually has these two roots, Vin and Aya. Aya means suffering state. Vin means cut, destroy. Destroy your going to suffering state, Vinaya. It is the self-discipline pulling back not rushing into suffering state. That's Vinaya. No. Can you give any example when you rush headlong into suffering states today? Anyone rush into suffering today? Anyone in a hurry to rush into suffering? But we do that all the time. When we rush to judge, when we rush to condemn, when we rush to get angry, when we rush to develop ill will, when we rush into jealousy, when we rush into envy, when we rush into craving, when we rush into attachment and strong desires, when we rush into lust, we are rushing into suffering. So what's the hurry? So what prevents us from rushing into suffering? It's called Vinaya. It's discipline. It's pulling back, restraining ourselves. So pati moke a sangvaro means to pull ourselves, have discipline. Don't rush into suffering. Mata nyuta batasmin. 
Mata nyuta means having the right understanding, the right measure. Take only what we need. Take only what is necessary. Knowing the measure, that is called mata nyuta. Ce batas min. Bata here means food. Taking food, knowing the right measure. Food here can be uh, figurative. Yeah. Food in Pali is called ahare. And how many kinds of ahare is there? Yeah. You have kabalingkara ahare, material food, which is coarse, which is tangible, soft and hard, which we take to satisfy our hunger and to process to give us energy. That is kabalingkara ahare. But there are other kinds of food also that we take. For example, food for the senses, paso ahare. You know, when we see things, you know, what are eyes for? You know, what are your eyes for? To see the letter S A L E, sale. No, your eyes are actually meant for reading Dharma books. <laughs> didn't, didn't Dharma speakers tell you that? Yeah. We want to satisfy our craving using our six senses. So that is why we look around, see something that is beautiful. When we see it from far, we will tell our friends and companions, Jom kita pergi sana. Kenapa? Ada sana cantik. We are drawn there, correct or not? When we hear something nice, we will ask our companions, Hey, come, come, let's go. Why go there? Because some promotion is going on. Not Dhamma talk, but some, some promotion, sales or... You know, uh, warehouse sale or something. What's going on? And smell. We smell something nice. Wow, what's that? Good food. We follow the scent. Correct or not? And similarly, we like to touch soft things, comfortable we feel, and so on. all these things. Today, if it is a very hot day, we will find somewhere cool in order to get some refuge from the heat. And that is a kind of food for the senses. It's called pasuahara. And also food for the mind. Mano san chetana hara. You know, ideas are food for the mind. You sit there, you get bored. We get creative. We think of ideas, philosophies, ideologies, and so on. So food here, we must know the right measure. The problem is our overdrive in desire and craving. Then we lose the sense of knowing when to stop. We take it all the time. We are uh, avid consumers and we don't know how to see that that leads to the arising of defilements like greed, craving, and excessive obsession and attachment. We don't see that anymore. So a practitioner of Dhamma who wants to eradicate suffering, who wants to eradicate the causes of suffering that are defilements, have to develop the right understanding to know the right measure about consumption, consuming anything. We must know what is necessary and what is harmful, what is harmless. We take only what is harmless but at the right time and the right measure. So this is called mata nyuta cabatas min. Pantang saya nasanang. Pantang here means secluded from. Literally, it means very remote or secluded. Saya nasanang means seats and beds and couches. Literally, places where you can have a rest and lie down. Do we like that? When we go home after a long day, what do you do? Switch on the fan, switch on the aircon, and then plop. Plop into what? Huh? Sofa. Yeah. That's why it's very important to have good sofa, isn't it, people say? Important to have nice seats and so on. You don't like seats like they have in a monastery? You know, made of uh, plywood and plank, it doesn't, you cannot plop into it. You know? So people, once they plop into that, ah, the attachment and everything comes. See, and Soon, we want something else to cool the body, drink something. Soon, switch on the TV, listen to something, see something. Soon, hungry, eat something. Soon, lead to another, another, and another, and another. And this is called 
the flow and the flood of sensual desires. Kama Oga. Kama means sensuality. The flood and the flow of sensual desires. Non-stop. You know? Better than Shabbos. <laughs> Never stop the, the supply. This flood of sensuality and flood of sensual desires never stop. And it started developing when we were born and then until we die and continues from there on. Never stop. So we have to be remote, secluded from these sensual desires. Meaning to say, develop Santa Indriya. The sense organs must be well controlled and disciplined and please develop contentment. Just now we mentioned how important and essential contentment is in practicing Dhamma. Yeah. Adichitta cha ayogo. Ayogo means to uh, devote ourselves to, to pursue. Adichitta. Adichitta, adi means higher. Chitta literally means mind. So higher mind. Here it means develop noble thoughts, higher thoughts. Now, we have thoughts all the time, correct or not? Yeah? What do we think about mostly? Oh, we think about mundane things like how to work, how to carry out our responsibilities and duties, and how to uh, maximize our sensual pleasure, how to find comfort, correct or not? What to do on Saturdays? You know, today is thank goodness Friday. And uh, most people don't feel enthusiastic coming to listen to Dhamma talks. They are more enthusiastic enjoying their senses. So these are what normal beings, we call them uh, potujana, potujana, worldly beings. Their predominant thoughts are about enjoyment, uh, livelihood, and also to gain and to possess more and more. But Adichita, higher thoughts, noble thoughts, more refined thoughts, more helpful thoughts, more spiritual thoughts, are thoughts about letting go, renunciation, about stopping the flood and the flow of sensuality that flood us down to suffering. You know, the, the flood of sensuality don't flood you higher up in life. Water don't flow up. We flow down. And the Buddha says, down there, there are dangers lurking. You know, you, you, you get caught up in a lot of dangers when we allow ourselves to float down with the flood of sensual desires and so on. So develop higher uh, and noble and spiritual thoughts like thoughts of letting go and renunciation. Also, contentment. And also, uh, restraint. Yeah? Also, thoughts about spiritual attainment and thoughts about Nibbana. Thoughts about Nibbana. So whenever, for example, from young, I've been developing these thoughts. And I think, wow, this is very nice. You know, uh, this is very good. But somehow... At the back of the mind, there is this additional uh, appendix. Yeah, it, it, it adds in. But this is not the ultimate happiness. You are happy, good, but it is not the ultimate happiness because the Buddhas and the enlightened ones declare that Nibbanang Paramang Sukang. Nibbanang Paramang Wadanti Buddha. Nibbanang Paramang Wadanti Buddha. Okay, go back 106 times more. <laughs> so this is adhichitta. This is to develop the mind so that it appreciates what is even more refined and noble. So that it is not stuck with the mediocre or stuck with the defiling, those that defile us. So this the Buddha all declare, all Buddhas declare as the summary of the teaching. So I hope everyone has learned this. And I put there in summary, all enlightened ones from past till present and even into the future teach the same doctrine as above, which is the eradication of defilements. And they elucidate to us the straight path 
leading to liberation from samsara, you know, the repeated rounds of birth and death, rebirth and redeath. And in the tradition of truly enlightened ones, there is no hidden or secret teachings reserved only for the chosen few. In the words of the Buddha himself, he said there is no closed feast of the teacher. So today it is quite fashionable when people say, oh, this one you cannot understand one because it's only for you know, special people like us. You know, my guru only transmits this uh, to certain people who are devoted to him, who are devoted to his practice. But the Buddha himself declared very wisely, put it on record, it's in the handset, uh, in the tipitaka we call it today. It says, there is no close feast of the teacher. Ananda asked him not only once, but a couple of times on a couple of occasions. Ananda asked before the Buddha passed away, is there something else that you know, perhaps you didn't tell us yet? <laughs> or is there something else or something extra that you want to tell us now? And he, he did that several times, from Vaishali to Kushinara. And the Buddha said, no, Ananda, how many times do you have to ask? But the, the purpose is clear, the intent is clear. And the Buddha declared, and why did Ananda ask several times? Because there were different audiences. So next week when Uncle Vijaya sees the different audience, he will repeat the same thing. <laughs> so, there is no close piece of the teacher. Nothing is hidden from us, my dear friends. Is Anicca hidden from us? Can we not see Anicca? Yes, we can. Can we see Dukkha? Is Dukkha hidden from us? Only for the chosen few? <laughs> no, it's for all of us. It's very democratic. Is Anatta hidden from us? No. Nothing is hidden from us. And that's what the Buddha said. Tilakna, Anichang, Dukang, Anatang. It's not hidden from us. But why can't we see them? Because we are looking at the wrong direction. Just like germs are not hidden from us, but we don't see germs normally. But if we apply a special lens, magnify it, we see clearly so many germs. So similarly, when we develop wisdom, we magnify it and we see our defilements. But at the same time, we know how to purify our own mind. And that is by not indulging ourselves in papasa, in anything that defiles us, stop. In anything that is skillful, go ahead, cultivate it. And the purpose of doing this is to purify one's own mind. And this is the teaching of all Buddhas. All enlightened ones, all realized ones teach the same doctrine. And this is helpful and beneficial to us. For our welfare, for our happiness, and for our freedom from suffering, out of compassion, the Buddhas have taught. So out of compassion for ourselves, this is what we should take up and cultivate. So my dear friends, thank you very much for being here tonight. I feel very honored. The Venerable Punaji is here, Venerable Bodhicitta is here, Anka Vijay and all of you are here, have taken your time to come. But jangan balik sia-sia, wahai kawan-kawan ku. <laughs> jangan sia-sia saja mendengar Dhamma. Harus balik menghayati, thinking of Dhamma. Don't immediately go out of the vihara, go into your car, and then start the flood of sensuality again. Check. Skillfulness we have to apply in our lives. Because remember, whatever the Buddha taught, if we apply any of them, it will bring us immense happiness. And the more we take up, the more happy we would experience. I dedicate this talk to our late teacher, Venerable Kirindi Sri Damananda, and to all teachers from the past, to all our spiritual guides and spiritual friends, and to all of us, and to all beings. May all beings learning the Dhamma, realizing it, be free from suffering. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful always. Sabe Sata. Suki Honto.
our deepest appreciation and the highest thanks to Brother Tan for delivering an excellent talk. <coughs> Any questions, brothers and sisters? Bante Punaji? Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Brother Tan, for such a wonderful talk. I have one question. Just now, Brother Tan said that a wise one will not do anything that hurt others or harm others. But when I reflect upon myself, sometimes when we want to do good, for example, we want to always go to the temple, and probably our family member, they are not happy. They will say that, if you go, then you don't care about me, I'm not happy. So are we causing harm to others despite that actually we want to do good. So, how we deal with it? This session is called Question and Answer with Venerable Punaji. <laughs> <laughs> Before Bande answer, uh, we have to check. Not harming others means not harming others uh, intentionally. We never had the intention to harm others. But our action may not always please others. See, my friend asked me, Breton, you know, tonight can come and uh, what you call uh, my house or not, house blessing. I said, no, I have to go to Vihara. There's a, a talk going on Friday. I said, Yo, but how often I move house? My first time only. I said, what to do? Why not you move to the Vihara? So our action cannot please everyone, but our intention should not harm anyone. And so this is the key. So when our actions, uh, despite our best intentions, do not please people, then this is the time our goodness, our qualities kick in and we are spiritually, wholesomely creative. Yeah. You know, creativity is not only used when we are scheming and for unwholesome deeds. Creativity can also be applied with wholesome deeds. It is called skillful way of making others happy. Skillful ways of making others, you know, peaceful. Yeah. So we enhance our own wisdom, and we are able to do that better and better. Okay. Yeah, I hope that's clear to you. Thank you, Brother Tan. Um, I have a question uh, in terms of responsibility. Um, I work very hard because I want to gain enough money for my next generation. So how should I, you know, I know I have to balance it, but I just worry there would not be enough. So I was thinking I should do it more, do it more, but not for myself, for my family, for my parents or for my children. How, how should I overcome this thinking? Thank you. Um, this requires some uh, elaboration, but because of uh, the situation, we will keep it very short. Uh, it seems very noble that when we want to uh, work, but it's not for myself, you know, Bratan, you look at my wardrobe. Uh, I don't have many kinds of, you know, clothes. You look at my shoes, only three pairs. But I still work hard because I want to provide for so it seems very noble. It seems uh, very responsible. It seems very uh, outstanding or, or selfless. Yeah. Uh, that is what normally people in Malaysia and Singapore, why we work so hard for. But the more we work, the how hard we work, no matter how hard we, we work, you will always have the situation where it is not enough. If the people we serve and work for don't have contentment. When we don't have contentment, we become very difficult to support. Dukkha yeah. bhariyati. You know. In the Metta Sutta, we have Sandusakoja, Subharoja. When we have contentment, we develop Santusa. Sukha bhariyati. We become very easy to support. But when we have no contentment, we become very difficult to support. Therefore, people who work for us have to work 
very hard. So when you provide them with material needs, please provide them with this understanding as well. It is called providence of Dhamma. Dhamma Dana. Let them understand the value of contentment the, that enhances the quality of their lives. Anyone who has contentment has great happiness. Feels adequate. Don't feel inferior. Feel satiated, satisfied, fulfilled. Never always feel lacking and wanting and searching and comparing and feeling inferior and searching non-stop. Yeah. Yet cannot find happiness. So as we provide for our family members and dependents, please provide them also with this understanding, this Dhamma Dana, because it really enhances the quality of life for everyone. Okay, so if we cannot directly talk to our dependents, for example, children or parents, sometimes we talk to them, they say, ah, your excuse, you don't to work hard for my holiday. Ask your Dharma teacher to go and talk to them. <laughs> Ask Dharma friends to come to the house and have a discussion on contentment. That helps. That helps a lot when you have Dharma Savana, Dharma Sakacha, listening to Dharma and discussion of Dharma on topics that promote wisdom, it helps. So have uh, the habit of discussing Dhamma with our family members and dependents. It is not to make our life easier, but it is aimed at making their life even better. Okay, so I hope in short. Thank you very much everyone for the questions. And uh, we will see you the next time. And the next week, Uncle Vijay will be talking about a uh, very important topic. Yeah. Who is the Buddha? Yeah. Who is the Buddha? So that's next Friday. So with uh, uh, humble thanks to uh, Venerables for being here and to all. Uh, Suki Hontu. We now invite Bhante Unaji Mahatera to share the merits. Now we are thinking of our late chief and uh, if he was living it will be the 99th birthday huh? and uh, out of all the temples, monasteries, I think this is the real place where a propagation of the Dhamma has been going on. Now we have various temples in England, United States and in all many European countries. But one important weakness is that they are mainly catering to the needs of the Sri Lankan uh, people who are living there. That means there are dhanas given to the monks, there is uh, spirit chanting and blessings and uh, funeral ceremonies and all kinds of things like that happening. But propagating the Dhamma either to the Americans or the Canadians or the British, or the other Europeans, or even uh, in Australia, the real propagation is not happening. This is one place 
where real propagation of the Dhamma is going on. Not only in terms of giving talks or even teaching meditation. Books are being printed and distributed all over the world. This is something great that the late chief started. It is the efforts of the late chief that a real propagation of Dhamma has been going on. And we are setting an example to the world. And this is why, although at the beginning I went to the United States, I came here towards the end of my life. That means I have been living in United States for about 40 years. And I have been living in Sri Lanka for about 40 years. And now I am here because once when I came here, our late chief invited me to come and stay here. But I couldn't stay at that immediately. But later when I came, unfortunately, the late chief had passed away. But when I came, I was invited to stay. And so I remain here to do whatever I can to help in this same propagation of Dhamma. So the important thing is, it was our late chief that really started this work of propagating the Dhamma to the world. And let us share the merits uh, with the late chief and may he ultimately be able to gain freedom from all sufferings of samsara and attain the highest and most supreme bliss of nirvana. See it sadhu, sadhu. And let us now, whatever merits we have acquired, let us share the merits with all departed relatives and all beings and let us do this in the formal way by reciting idam me nyati nam hotu sukita hontu nyati yo idam me nyati nam hotu Sukita hon tu nyatayo. Sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang hotu. Idang me nyati nang hotu. Sukita hon tu nyatayo. Sukita hon tu nyatayo. Etta vatacha amhei. Sambhatang punya sampadang. Sambhatang punya sampadang. Sabbe deva anumodantu. Sabbe deva anumodantu. Sabbe bhuta anumodantu. Sabbe bhuta anumodantu. Sabbe satta anumodantu. Sabba Sampati Siddhiya. Sabba Sampati Siddhiya. May through the power of all these merits, may everyone be able to gain freedom from all suffering 
of samsara and attain the highest and most supreme bliss of nirvana. Say sadhu, 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 sadhu. Bhav tu sabh mangalam rakkandu sambh devata sabh buddhanu bhavena sada sutti bhavantu te bhav tu sabh mangalam rakkandu sabh devata sabh dhammanu bhavena Sada sutti bhavandu te bhavtu sabh mangalang rakkandu sabh devata sabh sanghanu bhavena sada sutti bhavandu te